Welcome to GitHub Satellite. Thank you so much for coming. We have a lot of exciting stuff to share with you, and we hope you will share a lot of exciting stuff with us over the next 24, 48 uh, million hours or so. Uh, we'd like to start the conversation here, but as we all know, this is a connected world. We have the internet in our pockets. Let's keep talking. Let's keep working together. Let's keep building really great software. So to start, what is going to happen over the next few days? Um, well, there's going to be a rave, as you can tell from the lighting and everything. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, this is such an amazing venue, and there's a lot of really great information and a lot of really great speakers that we've gathered together who are going to be speaking with you. So make sure to not miss the breakout sessions. There's going to be a focus on community, professional services, and of course, an after party. There are two stages where the talks will be had. This dome-looking thing here, and then if you go outside, there's actually another building where there'll be another track. So uh, be sure to check the agenda and don't miss any of the talks. Um, but of course, we are streaming this live, and all the talks will be available afterwards. So whether you are flying home or just looking for some light watching over the weekend, you'll be sure to not miss anything. So why is GitHub in Amsterdam? We are an American company. GitHub Inc. is incorporated in Delaware or somewhere. And uh, we started in San Francisco. But even though most of us grew up in the United States and a lot of us work there, GitHub is a lot more than a company. It's a lot more than a legal entity. It's a lot more than a building or a VPN. GitHub is a community. And even though I grew up in the US and we started the company in the US, GitHub didn't come from the US. GitHub came from the whole world. We are very much an international community, whether we like it or not. And luckily, we do like it. And so I wanted to share with you a couple of stats, a couple numbers about the GitHub community, and in particular, the GitHub community in Europe. It's growing, and it's growing pretty quickly. And we're pretty excited about that and wanted to share some with you. So to start with, in the past year, we've had a 21% increase in Activity, yes, there it is, active users from Europe. So what does this mean? Well, we on our website measure ourselves typically in terms of logged in users, registered users, and repositories. But as you know, you don't have to have a GitHub account to download a repository. There are plenty of people, particularly people that are newer to development, maybe they're students, maybe they're just dipping their toe in, who can come to github.com and download a repository. We see many, many times more anonymous users visiting our websites than we see logged in users. But overall, we've seen a 21% increase in visitors from Europe in the past year, which is pretty incredible given that that number is already quite high for us. Um, as terms of total numbers, 36% of all traffic to GitHub is from Europe. And so only a small percent is actually from the US. We see a lot of traffic from South America, a lot of traffic from Europe, a lot of traffic from Asia. And again, you might think, oh, well, as a US-based company, that is curious. But as we all know, everyone here knows, the open source community is international. The open source community is everywhere. The open source community isn't about borders. And if anything, as I'm going to talk about, a lot of the open source community's projects are about breaking down borders and opening up communication and making the world more connected, more collaborative, more together. This is the number I just talked about. OK, uh, here's my favorite stat, because it's three digits instead of two. So in the past year, even though we've seen an increase of 21% traffic to GitHub.com from Europe, we've doubled the amount of new signups. So a lot more people are visiting the website, but way more people are signing up. And what we typically see is that when someone signs up, when they create their first pull request, they become a member of the open source community. Their first pull request isn't their last in almost every case. They start contributing, they start collaborating, they start working with you. Uh, maybe well, someone here is one of these people. Um, or maybe it's someone you know, maybe it's someone you work with. So we've seen a lot of growth in Europe over the past year. And while we're excited, while we think GitHub is growing quite well, we really think that this is a testament to the growth of the open source community. We are members of that community, we're fans of that community, and we're really in awe of the work a lot of you are doing and a lot of the work the community is doing to help bring in new people, to help it grow, to help solve some really tough problems both in business and in the world, which we're going to talk about. So when we say Europe, what are we talking about? Well, these are some of the most visited countries to GitHub.com in Europe. And I'm sure these look familiar. And uh, if you look at them on the map, it looks a lot like this. And this isn't really just the top countries 
in Europe that are visiting GitHub. This is really the top countries in the world that are visiting GitHub. There's so much activity from these countries. There are so many developers building software, both in open source and in enterprise, and increasingly in both. And that's a lot of what we're here to talk about today, is the world I grew up in was a world of dichotomies, a world where there was open source and there was closed source, and you had to pick a side. That's been gone for years. And a lot of people are just now realizing that. And I think a lot of that is thanks to projects like Linux, thanks to projects like open source programming languages like Ruby and Python, and thanks to major companies that have realized they've built a lot of value on top of open source projects. And they've been able to hire really great engineers who do really great work by using open source projects. And so even though a lot of the world is still stuck in this idea of enterprise versus open source, what's happening and what's actually out there and what we're seeing and what you all know is that it's really about developers and it's really about software development. And it's a lot more nuanced than closed source or open source. It's really about building the best software with people. And that and sometimes means going to the open source world and sometimes that means building something internally. But really we see a, a huge and growing mix of both which we're really excited about because what that translates to are bigger companies becoming more open. Bigger companies releasing more open source software, encouraging their employees to contribute to open source software, evaluating people based on the work that they've done in an open source community or looking at their code over a resume. And that's really exciting for us because it's something that we've believed in and seen work for a long time. Here's our map. So I want to talk a little bit about open source. I already did talk about open source, but I'm going to talk about some more because it's really, really important to us. Um, it's a lot more than just a movement or an ideology. It's a great way of building software. It's a great tool for getting excellent results. And while we for a long time have shown examples of things like Linux, we've pointed to something maybe like MySQL, we'll look at the success of Node.js, a lot of these projects have been grassroots. It's been you on a weekend inventing something interesting, coming up with a new technology, sharing it with the world, slowly building momentum, and then the next thing you know, you have a jQuery. But what's happening now is that companies are seeing the value of open source, of being open, and while there are still and will always be projects that start on a weekend, that grow, that become a large community, we're seeing large commercial companies that are embracing and fully contributing to open source projects. And not just the Googles and the Mozillas of the world. There are some companies who classically have been anti-open source, who have been closed, who have been secret, who have been private as their way of doing business that are now embracing open source and really sort of uh, putting us all to shame with how well they're doing it and how seriously they're taking it. And so the first example that I'd like to talk a little bit about today is this project called Swift. How many people have worked with Swift before? A couple people, all right. I think next year there will be a lot more hands because this is a new technology, it's a new project, um, it's a new programming language, but the way they're doing it is sort of revolutionary. It's from Apple, it was developed internally, it's open source, and the way that they're running the project really proves that open source is a lot more than just showing code or making code available. It's what we call it in the title of the source is open, but as I'm sure many of you know, it's a lot more work to run a great open source project than to just post code online. I've done that a lot of times, and it hasn't always worked out well for people that are using my software. What tends to work well is building a community, fostering collaboration, having good contributing guidelines so you have less issues and less back and forth, trying to build great software, setting out a vision, setting out a roadmap, and doing it together. And Swift is doing this really, really well. They're not only utilizing some of the best practices in open source development, they're defining a lot of them too. And so I could go on and I could show you while I'm on stage a picture of another person who's on stage, but I would encourage you to check out the Swift repository yourself. Go look at what they're doing. Look at when they code. Look at how they respond to issues. Look at their documentation. They're really setting a great standard for not just a corporate entity that used to be private opening up some of its code, but just a solid open source project. And this is what we mean when we say there's no longer a dichotomy between enterprise and open source. We see companies like Apple that are fully embracing the open source model because they understand now it's a way to do business really well. It's a way to build software really well. It's a way to get what they want. 
and what they want is better software. And that's a lot of what we're here to talk about today, is what tools, what techniques, what communities can we share with each other to build software better, to make it less stressful, to make it a more enjoyable experience, and ultimately to do something better for the people who are using our software for the impact and the change we want to have in the world. Stack Overflow every year does a developer survey, which we are huge, huge fans of. Um, you should definitely check it out if you haven't seen it already. One of the things they ask is the most loved programming languages. And this year, number two was Swift. And so not only is this an open source project that has Apple's name on it, that has a lot of stars, which are cool. Um, it's something that developers really like. It's something that's really interesting to a lot of people. And it's something that I think is going to go a long way. And we're going to be hearing a lot more about over the next few years. And if you look at this list, Rust is on there, F Sharp, Scala, Go, Clojure. These programming languages and environments have a lot of things in common. And one thing that they all have in common is that they're open, is that they're being developed somewhere with a team with contributing guidelines where anyone can contribute and work on them together. And this is really not just the future of programming languages and VMs, but we think the future of all important software. A lot of stars, 29,000. I think we have like 600 people, so if you all jump in, we can get it to 30. Anyway. Um, there's also some really interesting programming um, ideas on GitHub related to Swift. There's a Swift evolution repository where they're discussing the future of the language and trying things out and experimenting and really taking the branch-based workflow to a whole new level in a separate repository where they can experiment with new language features and ideas without necessarily working through the main repository. So in just the last 30 days, there's been over 270 pull requests that are merged on the Swift project. And 1,800, is that right? 1,800 pull requests merged since launch. Those are big numbers. They're big numbers. Trust me. Um, and like I said, Swift is an interesting case study. It's something we're talking a lot about because of the change in sort of mentality and philosophy and output of a company like Apple. But they're not alone. They are following in the footsteps of giants. Java programming languages, open source, Ruby, Python, C. A lot of these projects that we use and build the whole world today on top of our open source. And you can go see how they run. And what's interesting is it's not about the code being open. It's about the way you run the project. So here's another really interesting project that we are uh, big fans of. It's called TensorFlow. This is something that I've heard about for a long time, machine learning. This is the idea that robots are going to rise up and overtake us. Um, and Little did you know, fun fact, it's already here. We talk about machine learning, we talk about AI, we talk about deep learning and things like that, but often it's in a press article or it's a tech demo or it's a talk at a conference. But this is what's really amazing. It's, all, it's already here. You can go to the TensorFlow repository. You can check it out right now. You can start playing with it. You can start integrating it into your own projects. Machine learning is here. It's open source. It's readily accessible. And it's something that you can contribute to. If you're interested in using this in your software, seeing how it works, and giving back, you can definitely do that. Google is a huge, huge proponent of this. And TensorFlow is used in some of their existing projects, such as Google Photos. Their idea of learning who you are, learning about your content, making suggestions, this is backed by some of the open source technology released in TensorFlow. So yes, it's pretty awesome. Uh, check it out today. Uh, machine learning is here. The robots will overtake us. But we can help program what that looks like. So I've got a quick little demo showing you the flow. So TensorFlow is a lot about when you get into it data streams and deriving information from them and then making decisions based on them in the future. And so there's a lot of documentation. There's a lot of demos. There's a lot of information available. And this goes to the point, again, where it's not just some code that's hosted on a GitHub repository. It's really a community. It's really a project. There's a really a lot of information there specifically to help you get up and running, whether you want to use this project or you want to contribute to it. So one of the things that's really interesting about GitHub is we started it as a way for us to build software together. I was a developer that wanted to use Git, and I couldn't figure out how. And I had some friends who were developers that wanted to use Git, and they couldn't figure out how. So like all good developers, we tried to cheat and hack it and create a really easy way to share Git repositories. And that became GitHub. But the mentality was very much on the websites we were building, the games we were hacking on, the machine learning algorithms that we were interested in playing with. But GitHub is a lot more than that. GitHub is a way to contribute, to collaborate, to work with other people. And a lot of what I'm discussing and showing is documentation. It's about 
building things for humans that aren't necessarily code. And what we've been really amazed by at GitHub is how people have taken this to the next level by not discussing necessarily code, but discussing ideas, by discussing policies and procedures, and using GitHub as a platform to help open up different organizations, and specifically the government. So one of the things people ask me sometimes is, you know, what, what surprises you? What's the cool new repository on GitHub? What's the cool new programming language? If you read Hacker News, if you read the Stack Overflow developer survey, I don't really have anything to add there. But what is interesting to me is that we're talking about Apple releasing Swift in open source. And we're talking about Microsoft finally releasing the .NET CLR and people contributing to it years ago. Years ago, the government was using GitHub to open up its data and to collaborate with its constituents. So in many ways, the government is ahead of the curve, perhaps for the first time in history, when it comes to working with developers and opening up their data. And this isn't just the US government, or this isn't just the, the German government. This is hundreds of governments from cities and states and countries all over the world. So one example that we're really excited about is what the UK government is doing with this project called AlphaGov, and specifically this project called Whitehall. So what they're doing is they're creating a framework and a platform for departments inside the government to be able to create their own website and surface their data to their constituents. So one issue that a lot of departments have is their job is what, the Motor Bureau, something to do with taxes, something to do with event space, license registration, probably. They're not experts in web development. They're not experts in communication. It's not what they know. So what can you do? Well, you can either bring experts to them, or you can make it really easy to become an expert or you can obviate the need for being an expert at all. And that's one of the ideas behind Whitehall, is making it really easy for different departments in the government to publicize their information and have a two-way communication channel with people who are interested in getting information. So this is really exciting to us because we see this a lot in the US government as well. In the past two State of the Union addresses, the entire speech was published on Medium and the budgetary data was published on GitHub as a CSV file. So this is really, really cool and just goes to show you that the code is really important, but what's more important is people working together. And there are governments that are finding out now a really easy way for them to work together to hear the voices of their people is to put something on a platform like GitHub, or in general, just to embrace the web, to embrace the ways that we communicate with each other, the ways you communicate with your friends, with your colleagues, with your companies. Governments can communicate with people the same way. So there's going to be a talk uh, later today on AlphaGov, but just go to gov.uk. It's already live. You can already see it. There was a massive effort internally over the past couple years to really modernize the gov.uk website and make it easy for the different departments to contribute. And you can see the result of that hard work online today, as well as a blog where they're detailing a lot of what they've worked on, and I believe it's called Project Inside. So the idea is making the insides available outside. So go to gov.uk to see what that looks like. And you can go to the blog on gov.uk to see what Project Inside is all about. There it is. There's a picture. It's a sneak peek right there for you. Um, OK, so usually when we go to conferences, we don't like to talk too much about ourselves. But we're here. It's a GitHub conference. We're going to talk about ourselves a little bit. And uh, one of the things that we're really proud of at GitHub is shipping, and not just shipping things that are interesting, but shipping things that are high quality and high value for you. GitHub is all about the developer. If there's one thing that defines our company, defines why people are there, that defines our mission or our vision or our reason for being, it's about the developer. It is about software. We care a lot about software, but we care more about the people building it. We want to make it a great experience. We want to make it easy. We want to open up the power of building software to everyone in the world, and we want to make anyone building software way better at it today. This is a never-ending journey for us, and it's something that we think about all the time, and it's something that we have a hard time with. What does the future of software look like? What are you doing that we're not seeing? How can we change our product, our events, the way we think about ourselves to make building software something that anyone can get involved with and everyone doing can do it better? So we've done a couple things in the past year, um, not the past year, this year, that we're really proud of. And one of them is this idea of returning to social. When GitHub started, we were heavily influenced by Twitter. We were heavily influenced by Facebook. We were influenced by message boards. And we didn't look at the bugzillas and the tracks of the world and say, we want to build another developer tool. 
Instead, we looked at the ways people communicate online, and we took a lot of those ideas and we put them onto a new developer tool. We wanted to be something that people really liked using. We wanted to be something like a consumer product for people doing work. There's a lot of reasons for that. One, we didn't like our tools. And B, we know that a lot of these companies have put a lot of time and effort and research into figuring out ways to make people use their website. And so while we don't have a feature currently that helps you talk about baby photos, we have a lot of features that help you talk about code. And what we're doing now is we're looking at the world, we're looking at the way we work, and we're evolving. And one of the ways we're evolving and the world is evolving is emoji. Um, and it's silly, but it's also real. And so we released emoji reactions this year, and we've already seen a dramatic decrease in the amount of issue comments that are left on GitHub. So one way to think about this is all numbers should be going up. We are looking for a hockey stick. Less issue comments is a bad thing. Another way to look at this is what are we really trying to do? We're trying to make you more productive. We're trying to give you more time to focus on your code. We say sometimes that GitHub should be like Wi-Fi. You should only really think about it when it breaks, um, which isn't totally true and not the greatest analogy, but there's something to that. We want to free you to spend time thinking about your code, thinking about your problems, and not dealing with our interface, not dealing with our product, not typing the same thing over and over again. So emoji reactions are something that are quickly coming to be a standard feature in a lot of social applications, and it's something that we've added to GitHub as a quick, easy way to, to communicate. Recently, we had a thread internally discussing whether there should be a toaster oven made available in the GitHub kitchen. And it was the first time I've seen the down thumb used so adamantly. It was a very heated discussion. Um, but the intention was clear. And you'll be happy to know that we decided to go with the toaster oven. So if you ever visit HQ and you want to make a pizza bagel, we have you covered, thanks to Emoji Reactions. So anyway, it's an optional feature. You don't have to use it. But we think it's a really quick way to just give some feedback, share what you're thinking, and not have to type a comment in. So while that is small, I think it's indicative of where our focus is right now. And our focus right now is on helping developers become more productive. Uh, another way that we're doing that is with this feature called issue and pull request templates. Anyone who runs an open source project of any sort of scale or size knows that you often get the same question over and over and over again. Um, one way that you can deal with that is perhaps, I don't know, a punching bag, exercising, some sort of stress relieval uh, routine. Another way is to help educate people and guide them into contributing in the way that works best for your project and works best for them. There is, to be serious for a moment, there's this scary feeling that I think almost everyone experiences when you're making your first contribution to an open source project. You're worried about the code itself. You're worried about entering into this community. You're worried about the reaction and your reputation. You're worried about doing the wrong thing. You can stay up all night reading all the documentation, but you never know what you missed. One really great way to communicate what you need to do is the contributing guideline. However, they haven't been as effective as we'd hoped. We can publish a contributing guideline in your repository, but not everyone sees them. So when we started listening to the community, and uh, thank you to everyone who wrote us a very nice letter earlier this year, one of the things we heard loud and clear was there's just a lot of repetitive work that open source maintainers are dealing with over and over again. And the contributing file, it's just not good enough. So we sat down and we started thinking about our own open source projects and how we can make the contributing file better. And we came across this idea of issue templates. It's something that other projects do. It's something that a lot of issue trackers have. And so you can leave a file in your repository, either in the root directory or in the .github folder, that automatically pre-fills what's in an issue body format. It can be instructions, it can be advice, it can be guidelines. But in many ways, it's beneficial to the maintainer because, again, you get less issue comments. And I guess our goal is to have no issue comments and everyone communicating with emoji. But really what it does is it helps someone who's contributing to a project know that they've checked all the right boxes. It helps them feel more confident. It helps them know that they're doing the right thing. So communication is a big emphasis for us this year. And from emoji reactions to issue templates, there's some small things we're doing that we think are going to have a big impact. And we're already seeing huge wins. Save replies is something similar. Uh, a lot of people might use something like text expander or some way of automating responses to issues or emails or, I don't know, uh, your family members. But now we have this built right into GitHub. You can save your popular replies. And so whether you're triaging on one repository or a million repositories, you can very nicely ask someone to write some unit tests, to add documentation, to read the readme, and not have to sit there typing. And every, everyone, everyone's happy. 
Finally, squash your commits. So for a long time at GitHub, we had this philosophy of guiding people towards a correct way of building software. One phrase we use is GitHub Flow. And it's this idea that our tool should really guide you towards the right way of building software. But the reality is there is no right way to build software. And that's not a bug. That's a feature. Even if everyone in the world used the same text editor, assuming it had a config file, we'd all be using something very different. And that's a really beautiful thing about development, is the diversity in the way we have our environment set up and the tools that we use and the people that we work with. And so we are more and more embracing that in every sense of the word at GitHub. And one way that's coming out is in how we don't necessarily guide you to the one correct workflow, but we guide you to the workflow that works best for you. So pull requests for a long time have only worked by creating a merge commit, which we've heard over and over again. People have said, that's fine, but that's not the way we work. And so we end up not using the GitHub merge button, not because we don't want to. I mean, it's a big green button on a website. I just, it's like a moth to a light. I just want to click on it, but because it doesn't work for our workflow. So we've added the ability to squash commits right from the merge button and uh, look for more different ways to utilize your Git workflow of choice in GitHub in the future. And if you don't know, squashing commits is this idea of when you create a branch and you submit a pull request, you can either merge the branch right into the target branch, or you can take all the changes on that branch, you can combine them together, and you can have a single beautiful commit that lists all the changes and shows it right there. Uh, some people prefer to work this way. Some companies require the, the, the workflow happen this way. And now you can use GitHub to squash your commits right from the merge button. This is what it looks like in alphabet speak. And there's the button. All right, so finally, this is not necessarily a feature, but it's something that we're really proud of, something that's really interesting. I don't know if everyone knows this, but there are not a lot of websites that host millions and millions of Git repositories. And so in many ways, we look to the open source community. We look to you for prior art. We want to use the best in breed technologies, and we're not here to solve every problem. So whether it's a database, whether it's a JavaScript framework, whether it's the state of the art and security, we're not always innovating on everything. We want to look to you and be a part of the community that is innovative so we can make our website, our experience really great for our users, and so we can focus on what we do best. One of the things that we do best is host Git repositories. And one of the things that we've changed recently is this project called Spokes. So previously, we relied on hardware to replicate your Git repositories. We'd have a RAID where there'd be different hard drives that to the software looked like a single unit. But if something happened, if that drive failed, if data was corrupted, there would be a number of different disks that would store the Git repositories. And we could manually bring one of those disks back. And then voila, your repository is fixed. However, that's very expensive. And um, it's not the best use of space time or our resources. And so one of the things we've been working on is this project we originally called distributed Git or dGit. So it's distributed, distributed version control, which is the, what we do is we innovate and we add not words in front of other words. But uh, it's a project that we call Spokes. And what this does is it replicates your data, your Git repositories on our servers across different file servers. And so this means without RAID, with just commodity hardware, with standard hard drives, we're able to do something similar where when you push to GitHub, you're pushing to multiple repositories. And if one gets corrupted or something bad happens, we can take that one offline and you won't notice anything. And this is an entirely software solution. Um, so there's some articles that we've released online where you can check out the architecture of spokes and some of the thinking behind it. But we think it's really cool, and hopefully it'll make your Git experience faster and more seamless in the future. And it's just another thing we're doing to try and make GitHub more awesome for everyone. So GitHub Enterprise. We have this thing called GitHub Enterprise. And it's uh, kind of a misnomer. A lot of enterprises use it, but really anyone can use it. Really what it is, it's an on-prem version of GitHub. It's your own private GitHub community, either behind your firewall, hosted on your VMware server, hosted on Azure, hosted on AWS, wherever. It's totally disconnected from the GitHub community in terms of network and database, and it lets you have your own community internally. We've got a lot of customers that are contributing to open source using GitHub.com and running their own enterprise instance internally. Um, if you've ever used Enterprise, you probably know that it's been around for a long time. It's been pretty tough to use for a while. And in the past few years, we've been working really, really hard on making it great. And one of the things that we've done that we're really proud of is this release called 2.5. So this is interesting for a number of reasons, one of which Enterprise used to only run on a single VM. And so there was a cap. You could only have 
well, I'm not going to say a number, but as many users as you wanted to try, but there would be a point at which it stopped working. It started being slow. You could only have so many users on GitHub at the same time uh, using a single enterprise instance. And so we ended up having customers that would have multiple enterprise instances inside their, com their company, which is tough in terms of maintenance, but it's just like heartbreaking in terms of what we're trying to do in the world. A whole point of GitHub is to bring people together, to have this one single platform where you can share code, and of course you can take your data with you, but we're all in the same place. You can have one search, you can find anything. We want to bring that to companies too. We want to make it really easy for a big company to have repositories from all different departments shared. People who maybe want to hack at something on the weekend can go work on some other project. People who are looking for great engineers can go find them in other places, parts of the company. So the idea that our enterprise customers were using multiple segregated instances we were like creating more silos with our software that we set out to create to break down silos. So you can imagine the heartburn and consternation from that. Um, and so what we're really excited about is this thing called clustering. Is now we have a solution where you can have multiple VMs, multiple servers, and they all look like one version of GitHub Enterprise to you. And so that was released sometime last month uh, with what we call Enterprise 2.5. And Infinite scale, I'm just going to say that. Infinite scale, probably, something like that. But now any enterprise can have everyone running on one single community internally, no matter how many repositories or users they want. And we can just scale with machines instead of trying to fit everything on one VM. So this is a really big uh, innovation for us and something we're really proud of and really excited about. And we're already seeing a lot of success with some really major co companies that are rolling out literally tens of thousands of developers using GitHub Enterprise, using social coding, using Git internally to build commercial and open source software. But that's not all. Uh, Enterprise 2.6 was just released a few weeks ago. And in addition to bringing in a lot of the social features, developer-centric, such as templates and pull request, uh, sorry, issue and pull request templates, emoji reactions, um, it also brings in a lot more speed. There's protected branches, which help you configure your workflows, and pre-received hooks, which we've been excited about for a long, long time. So if you have an enterprise install, you can now configure pre-received hooks and have a lot more flexibility in defining your workflow. So that's, that's uh, what we've done. And I'm going to keep talking about us a little bit. There's some new stuff today. Uh, did anyone check Twitter or Hacker News before I got on stage? So there's some exciting things that we want to talk about. Hopefully, you've seen it. Actually, I hope you haven't seen it, because I want to do like the Oprah thing where I make you look under your chair. So if you have seen it, just pretend like this is new. But uh, who has ever used this project called Electron? Anyone? A couple people. OK. This is really cool. This is uh, something that we're really proud of. And where it came from is really interesting. Many years ago, we set out to build, we'll say, a modern version of Emacs, even though Emacs is modern. And you might not like that phrase, because you might not be a fan of Emacs. But this idea of what does Emacs look like reimagined with some of the same design principles in a world where you can always assume there's a network, and if there's not, we can deal with that, where people are collaborating and working a lot more closely with each other, where people want to hack on their tools in the same way I said before, not just at the config file level, but actually the software. What if I want to change the way it looks and works and add different workflows and UIs to my editor? What do I need to do to make that happen? Well, in the Emacs world, there's Emacs Lisp, and there's a long history and a lot of really great packages there. But a lot of us don't know Lisp or haven't learned Lisp. What we do know is HTML and CSS and JavaScript. So a couple years ago, GitHub released this project called Atom. And Atom is an open source text editor designed for the future. It's designed to be hackable. It's designed to be extensible. There are thousands of packages available online that are open source that you can download, you can fork, you can change, you can do whatever you want with. Atom is a really great project for us because it's a great way to get more people developing. It costs zero dollars, and it's an extremely professional grade tool. But it's also a hackable editor. So you can customize it. You can play Minecraft in it, probably. You can do all sorts of stuff with it. But at its core, it's Focus is an editor that's hackable to make your life better, to make developers more productive. When we were building Atom, we realized that it's actually pretty difficult to build a native desktop application in web technologies. Um, and a lot of people have said, well, why would you even do that? Well, there's a lot of reasons, extensibility, openness, and whatnot. But one of the things that came out of Atom was this piece of technology that we call Electron. 
And Electron is a platform for building desktop applications in web technologies. Atom is just one example of an application built on Electron. And as we were building Atom, we saw that this framework, this platform for building desktop applications, was interesting and widely applicable on its own, and a way for companies, for open source projects, for meetups, to really quickly be able to spin up a native desktop application that works on all platforms without having to get into the nuance of OS X development or Linux development. So this is not us saying, this is the better way to build software. We think it's a great way to build software. We think it's a choice. I love native applications. I use Mac mostly, and I love Mac applications that are designed for the platform. When I'm using an Android phone, I love Android applications that were designed for the platform. But there's also a lot to be said for applications that break the mold, for wanting portability, for wanting to build something really quick, for just having a little helper in your menu item that points to a web page or looks like a nice SoundCloud playlist. And for all those use cases and more, we have Electron. Today, we're really excited to announce the 1.0 release of Electron. And so while a lot of companies have been using Electron for a long time, we are officially announcing that it's ready for prime time. And I just wanted to give a huge shout out to the Electron team. Some of them are here today for all the work they've done on Electron over the past year. So this is not. Some of these numbers are pretty surprising to me, I'm going to be honest, and I should know this. I, I, I'm involved in GitHub, the company, in a way. But uh, Electron has 27,000 stars on GitHub, which is almost as many as Adam has itself. And so this isn't just us saying, here's this option, here's this interesting way of building software. This is the community saying that. This is an open source project. We spent a lot of time and effort on it. But this is really a testament to the community and interest in the ability to spin up an open, an open source desktop application really quickly using web technologies. And part of that proof is that Electron has been downloaded over a million times since it came out. So this is not, this is the real deal. This is, this is pretty amazing. These numbers are pretty, pretty impactful. And so we think the future for Electron is even brighter. Um, we have some ideas for other applications to build on Electron, but that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is what you build on Electron. And we're really proud to say that companies like Slack and like Microsoft are already releasing Electron applications. Microsoft even built a text editor that competes with Atom on top of Electron. And we think that's a good thing. It's really cool. It's called Visual Studio Code. You should check it out. You should use Atom, but you should check it out. But <laughs> this, is, this is what's really exciting to us. Is this is a platform that anyone can use to focus on their interesting problem, on what they're building, on their contribution to the world. Nihilus is an open source extensible mail client. So if you're tired of mail.app or Outlook or whatever you're using Gmail and looking for something new, something built in the Atom philosophy of being able to hack it and extend it, check out Nihilus. It's available. And there's dozens more applications built on top of Electron. And so you can check out the Electron uh, website for a lot of them and add your own. Try it out. There's a quick start guide. It's pretty easy to get up and running. There are some open source projects that provide bootstrap-like buttons and paradigms and UI widgets. And so maybe you're building something internally for your company. Maybe you're building keynote presentation software. I don't know. Maybe you're just trying to hack on a robot. Check out Electron. It's a really great way to get started. So one thing that we've always been very proud of is this idea of we build GitHub for ourselves. And this is something that we've talked about. And uh, to an extent, it's been true, is that we try to work, we try to figure out a way to build software, and we use those ideas to change our products, to change our philosophies, to change our workflows. Sometimes it's, it's bit us. We don't use squash workflows. And so for a long time, we didn't have that ability in the merge button. But sometimes it's worked really well. And I think the core forking workflow the core pull request workflow, some of those ideas come not from me or some designer, but from the team that's building GitHub. So we've always really liked this idea of how we build software is something that we can share. And we take ideas from you, and we share ideas with you, and we build them into GitHub, and we take ideas from our competitors and our community. But ultimately, we're, we're eating our own dog food, or we're drinking our own, our own champagne. Well, that has not been true in one really important way since the very, very, very beginning. GitHub started not as a venture-funded company, not as a big business plan idea, but just as a way to scratch our own itch. We wanted an easy way 
I say easy, but like any way to share Git repositories, we were terrible at it. We wanted an approachable, accessible way to share Git repositories. We built it for ourselves, and we were storing repositories on disk. We were storing data. And so even though this was a side project, we said, OK, we should charge some money for this so that as it grows, it'll be sustainable. We want the popularity of GitHub to pay for the servers so that when we eventually have 500 customers or whatever, we're dreaming big, the thing will pay for itself. Um, as we know, GitHub took off. It really surprised us. We were really, really overwhelmed by the community and the support and the ideas that people shared with us. And GitHub just became a phenomenon, and we're really humbled to be a part of it. But one thing that we really haven't nailed yet is this idea of our core workflow being built into the product and being made available to everyone here. And a very specific way is in how we use private repositories. And so because we weren't venture funded at the beginning, because this was a side project that we wanted to be sustainable, we said, OK, we need to have a business model. We need to have some way of paying for these servers. And as you probably know, the way we paid for them is by making open source repositories free, because I'm not going to pay someone to host my open source code, and making private repositories cost money, because that seems reasonable. Unless I'm a student or embarrassed about my open source code, which we can help you out, I'm probably deriving some value by keeping it private. So the business model at its core has been open source is free, public repos are free, private repos cost money. We also decided to charge per private repository. This idea of, well, if we charge from space, for space, we're now competing with S3, and we don't want to get into that business. I don't want to ever compete with Amazon. They are relentless. Um, but what we, it's not also the value that we provide. GitHub's value is not in storing code. It's not in storage. It's not a backup server. There's tons of cheaper options for that. GitHub's value is it's a multiplayer game. It's a way to work with other people. It's a way to build software and design your flow and integrate with an ecosystem of amazing tools. And so we've charged you all for private repositories in the past. We've said, you can have 20 for this amount of money. You can have 40 for this amount of money. However, we're hypocrites. We don't pay for private repositories at GitHub. So the way we work is a little bit differently than the way you work. We have, the last time I checked, 1,600 private repositories in our GitHub organization. If that, I don't even want to calculate how much that bill would be, because I'm definitely not going to pay it. But there's a whole different way you think about the world when private repositories don't cost anything, when they're free, when they're unlimited, when you can start to think of them as an organizing principle and not a cost center, not a unit of value, but just a way to communicate and a way to work with other people. And so before I got on stage, we announced that every paid GitHub plan, whether it's $7 a month as an individual up to the largest organization plan, now comes with unlimited private repositories repositories. So we're really, really excited about this for a lot of reasons. Um, one, it's been one of the biggest feature requests we've ever had. Some people ask for private repos. Some people ask to pay per user. And that's the change that you're going to see in terms of pricing. Um, all organizations now we charge per user instead of per, per, per repository. And we've worked very hard to make this a, a good thing. And so. Um, the first five users will cost 25 bucks total. And then after that, it'll be $9 a user a month. We're giving everyone a long time to look at the plans and switch over. This is not going to be a forced thing anytime soon. And we think that there's a lot of value in paying per user, because really what you're getting is a workflow that we believe in and we think is superior. And of course, we're happy to pay per user. It's the way a lot of SaaS software has evolved in the past eight years since GitHub was created. But the other important point is on the individual plans. This is something we're really excited about. Individual plans on GitHub have always started at $7 a month, and they've gone up based on how many private repos you want. We're, we're getting rid of almost all of that. All individual plans are now only $7 a month for unlimited repos. So if, if you are someone paying 50 bucks a month for GitHub for your own personal plan, or $24 a month for your own personal plan, you're paying $7 now forever. So we're really, really excited about that. Thank you. And uh, of course, we have the student developer pack. So if you are a student, you can have unlimited private repositories for free. And if uh, this doesn't work for you, or you think your company is an outlier or an edge case, let us know. We want to make this really great for everyone. We're really excited about it. There's a big push internally to have the way we build software available to all of you so we can share it and be more open. And I think this is a huge milestone in that. So uh, thank you for all the feature requests, comments, and support over the years. And we're excited to see what you do with unlimited private repositories. Yes, thank you. All right. 
So they think they're a better way to work. They give you flexibility. They give you better workflows. We're going to be actually sharing a lot more information about how we use repositories um, in the coming months. And uh, hopefully, you won't think we're too weird, because we use them for all sorts of things. For example, the toaster oven conversation happened in a private repository focused on our headquarters. And uh, there's no code in it, but there's a lot of really great conversations and emoji reactions. And of course, GitHub Enterprise has always had unlimited private repositories. So these are the pricing plans, and you can check it out. This is all available online. Uh, so finally, we just wanted to talk about some really interesting projects that are happening on GitHub, not in terms of breaking down these barriers between open source and enterprise. I think that there's certainly still a case to be made that open source is a great tool for enterprises and that more companies should become more open. And I think that case is being made. But what we get really excited about and what we're really interested in is this, this century of software. This idea that over the past 100 years, everyone thought hardware was the impactful thing. That was a technology that's going to make all sorts of changes in the world. And it's true to extent. The internet, wireless microphones, I don't even know how this thing works, screens. Hardware has really transformed the way we live. Even from the time some of us were kids till now, it's become pretty incredible, the changes that are happening. But what we're really learning is that software is the thing. Software is the interesting technology. And we still have no idea what it's capable of. We're still in the very, very first days of understanding how software can change our lives. And a lot of that is thanks to the fact that hardware is cheap, it's ubiquitous. It's getting cheaper. It's getting more powerful. We now have processors and sensors and all sorts of things all over the place. And what you can do with that hardware is determined by your ability to write and ship software. And so what we're interested in is, yes, helping companies build better software. Yes, helping you build a business. Yes, helping you create open source, but making the world a better place. And this is the part where we make fun of ourselves for being from Silicon Valley and being from the US. But there's some really cool stuff happening on GitHub in the open source community, which is more than trying to make money, which is more than trying to build a business, which is more than sharing an interesting piece of technology. There are a lot of people that are spending a lot of time working selflessly to help other people improve their lives, improve the world that they live in, improve the circumstances that they're in, and help them make the world a slightly better place. And so we just wanted to highlight some of our favorite projects on GitHub today. And sort of challenge you. If you have free time, if you're interested this weekend, after you finish watching all of the talks uh, that you missed today, and you want to hack on a new project, there's always a new thing you can add to Swift. There's always a new JavaScript framework. There's always a faster way to make something more secure. But there are some projects out there that could really use your help that are doing something really impactful to people's lives. And so the first one we want to talk about is this open whisper system. So security is going to become more and more important to our lives every single day. And a lot of it comes from this silly idea that the internet was built on the fact that you could trust people. Um, you can trust most people, but not everyone. And so encryption and security, it's becoming really a lot more important. And I don't have to tell all you about the news and everything happening in the world in terms of security and encryption. Open Whisper, Whisper Systems is a group which is trying to make this sort of open source and available to everyone. And so you can check out this, this organization on GitHub, and you can see IM clients for desktop, Android apps, all sorts of applications that are focused on encrypted private IMing that are open source and made available. And this is something that's been vetted by Snowden has talked about it. Uh, Bruce Schreier has talked about it. There's a lot of security experts that are behind this Open Whisper System project. So I encourage you to check it out, particularly if, it, particularly if you're into this idea of freedom of speech and privacy and encryption and what data do you own and where are the personal boundaries. There's a lot of technology and a lot of technologists that are interested in answering these same questions right now, and they're doing it in the open source community. Also, if you want to have free private IMs, you can use this too. So it's cool. It's practical, but it's really quite interesting. This other one that we really like is called the Humanitarian Toolbox. And so this is a, a really, really impressively run open source project that helps communities create sort of disaster response and recovery. And so as you probably have seen, or maybe you've even experienced, when there's a disaster, things are crazy. You know, who do you talk to? Where do you go for help? Is everyone OK? Is the family OK? The cell phone towers are all clogged up. First responders are trying to get there. How do you coordinate? How do you get data from the people on the ground about what's good and what's not good and where help is needed? So there are some 
Facebook is actually doing a good job trying to help make this problem better. They have some, some software that says, like, I'm OK when there's a disaster that happens. But the humanitarian toolbox is trying to take this much, much further. They're trying to build systems that are open source that communities can use to help support their first responders and the community in the, uh, if there's a disaster. And so you should check this out if you're interested in helping literally save lives with code. It's something you can do from your coffee shop, from your living room, from your desk. You might think that you have to go somewhere or be involved or use your hands and really dig in to save someone's life or help make a change in the world, but you can do it from your laptop. There, is a lot of, there are a lot of projects out there that are looking for smart people that have time that can help make them better, and the Humanitarian Toolbox is one of them. So please check it out. We're, we're big fans of them. And similar, there's this project called OpenMRS. So Apple has done some interesting stuff lately, uh, not just on the Swift side, but on their care kit side by trying to open up frameworks that different medical technology companies can use to do things like analyze the data that the Apple Watch is, is collecting to try to detect whether someone has heart problems or even detect Alzheimer's really early based on patterns. Uh, that's, that's really great, and it's really inspiring. OpenMRS is something sort of similar. What they're trying to do is improve healthcare in the developing world, in places where resources are constrained. So maybe they don't have cheap computers. Maybe they don't even have internet. Maybe they don't have computers at all. Maybe they don't really have roads where they can ship papers back and forth or whatever. The, the, the resources are so different. The environment is so different. MRS, OpenMRS is a project that sorts to embrace those constraints and build a system where people can take their medical records with them, where doctors can have a really easy interface so they can see the history of the person they're working with, even though they might be in a place where there isn't internet or there isn't even clean water. So this is another instance of where technology really can make an impact. It's not the whole thing. It's not the whole impact. They have to be on the ground. You have to be thinking about these things. You have to be building a community and working with others. We still need money and support and time, but the point we're trying to make is we need code, too. It's not only code. But we can use code, we can use your brain, we can use your help. There are open source communities that are trying really hard to make an impactful change in the world, and they're either on GitHub or wherever, and you can help today. There's nothing stopping any of us. They all need us, and there's a lot of really amazing people out there who are pushing these things forward. And so later today, actually, one of them will be joining us, uh, Dr. Judy. Well, we did a profile of her on our GitHub blog talking about the OpenMRS project, how she got into development, how she learned how to program. I think it said she started on Visual Basic, which I, uh, I started similarly on Visual Basic. But she'll be here today talking about OpenMRS and other efforts in this area. So I encourage you to listen to the panel, check out the blog posts, uh, Google some of these projects. If you're interested in something new, if you're interested in a new way of thinking about open source, there's a lot of really cool stuff happening out there. There's machine learning. There's open source VMs. There's companies that are releasing their software, both op open source and inner sourcing. But there's also people that are trying to make a real difference in the world. And it's code. It uses pull requests. It uses a lot of the workflows we're familiar with. You can jump in. And we're really, really excited about it. So, Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much for coming to GitHub Satellite. I think this is going to be a really, really awesome event. Uh, please, please give a big round of applause to all the GitHubers that worked really hard to put this together. I'm, I'm really in awe of what they've done so far. And again, thank you for coming. Whether it's an open letter, whether it's tweets, whether it's talking here, we're listening. We're trying to make GitHub better for you. We're all about the developer. We are developers too. We want to share our workflows with you. We want you to share your workflows with us. We want to make building software a really amazing experience for everyone. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you for hosting us. And we'll see you on the internet. Thanks.